Okay, so basically today is the big day. You know, I've been promising you all these clone functions, the infinite polynomials that will approximate those complicated functions like tangent inverse, ln x, e to the x. We've already done a preview to this last time. Uh, last class, we looked at what f of x equals e to the x, and also we looked at the square root of 1 plus x, or that was part of your homework. But those are very specific functions. What we aim to do today is to generalize this for any given function f of x. That way, you don't have to go through this process every time you're, giving, you're given a different function. So we're going to come up with a general method to find an infinite polynomial that represents these complex functions. Now, what is the purpose of finding these infinite polynomials? I've already mentioned to you in the past. But uh, again, this handout that you have, which I have a copy up here for you, uh, it, it summarizes that. For example, sometimes when you have um, the infinite polynomial expansions, you can evaluate integrals that you couldn't evaluate before. For example, we're going to be able to do something like e to the negative x squared. There is no antiderivative. No matter how many techniques you study, there is no antiderivative for this function. There are ways to approximate it from, you know, if you have limits of integration, but there is no antiderivative for this. But if we can find an infinite series expansion for e to the negative x squared, then we're going to learn how to integrate it. Because think about it, polynomials are so easy to integrate. If, if a polynomial is, let's say, x plus x squared plus x cubed, etc., how do you integrate this? You go piece by piece, right? Integral of x is easy, integral of x squared is easy. So, again, if we can convert these functions into their polynomial equivalents, it's easy to evaluate them, um, and we understand how the calculators function better, just as it's stated over here. It's easier to integrate them because then you can convert them to their uh, simplistic functions and you go piece by piece. Also, when you go take differential equations, you're going to see that sometimes uh, solving a differential equation is very difficult for certain functions, but when you convert them to their infinite series expansions, again, it becomes easier. So how do we find these functions once and for all? Uh, you know, we saw the, um, for specific functions last time. So what we're going to try to do next is we're going to try to derive a formula so that no matter what the function f of x is, we can find a corresponding infinite polynomial uh, with just plugging the values into that formula. OK, so let's remember our goal, uh, just like we did last class. So we are, for these questions, we're going to be given a function. Let's say the function is e to the x. Okay, so we're given a function. That will be given to us. And we're going to specify a point, such as the point x equals 0. The question will be to find a polynomial that approximates the function around that point. And a typical polynomial, um, and again, call this a power series, which is an infinite polynomial. It just keeps dot, dot, dot at the end at a finite degree. A typical power series or an infinite polynomial looks like this. A constant plus a constant times x plus a constant times x squared, plus a constant times x cubed, etc. To find this polynomial, all we need to determine is what? If we're trying to find that polynomial that approximates f of x, what is the only thing or the only things that we need to determine? The coefficients, right? The a sub 0, a sub 1, a sub 3. We call it a, b, c last time when we did our problem. If we could determine the coefficients, we're done. We found a polynomial that approximates a function. And what was the criteria that we used last time? Basically, I listed the criteria over here. You know, if this polynomial is going to approximate this function at x equals to 0, then you want f of 0 to be equal to p of 0. That means they must be equal at the given point. What else do we want? We want the first derivatives to be equal, the second derivatives to be equal, and this is an additional condition. We want all successive derivatives to be equal. When you put that condition that all successive derivatives be equal, you're going to come up with an infinite polynomial. If you only put like the first two conditions or the first three, you only have a second degree polynomial. So we, we have all these conditions. And the first mathematicians who thought about this, uh, the, the credit is given to Taylor because he was the first one who published it. But it said that also there are two very, very famous mathematicians. One, of course, everybody knows Newton. Apparently, he was using these infinite series before even Taylor published them. And another uh, famous mathematician, last name is Gregory, and he was also using them apparently. But the first person to publish was Taylor, and later Maclaurin used them a lot. So that, for some reason, we refer to those two mathematicians um, for these series. 
Okay, now how are we going to determine the coefficients? That is our goal. How do we find a sub 0, a sub 1, a sub 2? If we can determine those, then we're done. We found the polynomial that we're looking for. The answer is going to include the function f of x. So you're not going to have like a sub 1 is equal to 5 because we don't know what the function is. All we know is it's f of x. So it's okay in our final answer if a sub 1 can be written in terms of f of x, a sub 2 can be written in terms of f of x, etc. because then when they give us the function, then we can calculate those. Okay, so let's start by writing... Um, let's start by writing what the polynomial looks like once again. So I'm going to go back and create a new page. Okay, so our polynomial, and this is on the bottom of your page, is going to look like this, a sub 0 plus a sub 1 times x plus a sub 2 times x squared, etc. Okay, so our job is to determine these uh, coefficients. So let's use the first condition. Okay, the first condition says the polynomial at the point 0, the p of 0, must be equal to f of 0. Okay, what is p of 0? Plug in 0 for every x, and what do you get? Uh, you get the very first constant, right? The a sub 0, right? Because every other x will disappear. So p of 0 is a sub 0, and this must equal to f of 0. And remember, it's okay to write these a sub i's in terms of the function values. So there is our first unknown solve. We solve for a sub 0 in terms of the function. It's always going to be the function evaluated at 0. For example, if your function is e to the x, the first coefficient will be e to the 0th power. Okay, so whatever the function is, evaluated at 0. Okay, let's try to find the second coefficient. We're going to use the second uh, equality. Again, this is also in your notes. So we, we need to use this, this one. p prime of 0 is equal to f prime of 0. But before we can find this, let's first of all find what is p prime of x, the first derivative of this polynomial. Who can tell me? What is the first derivative going to be? What is the derivative of a sub 0? Remember, the a sub i's are just constants, right? So the derivative of a sub 0 is 0. OK, plus what is the derivative of a1 times x? a1. What's the next derivative? 2a2x plus 3a3x squared, etc. 4a, 4x cubed, etc. So what, what do you get if you plug in 0 for x? What would you get? All the x terms are going to disappear, right? Because you would plug in 0 for x, 0 for x, 0 for x. What are we left with? Just a sub 1. Okay. And since from, this, since from this equality, since a sub 1 must be equal to what? So p prime of 0 equals to a sub 1, and from above it must be equal to f prime of 0. There we have our second uh, function, second coefficient solved. a1 equals f prime of 0. At this point, if you had to generalize, what would you think the answer is going to be? The a sub n, the any nth coefficient might be, Like a1 was the first derivative, right? a sub 0 was like the 0 derivative or no derivative taken. a sub n might be the nth derivative at 0, but let's not run to the conclusion so fast because things are going to change a little bit, but you will still have that term involved. Uh, let's do a couple more and then we're going to generalize it, but right now we don't have enough information to generalize it. Okay, so now let's do the second derivative because one condition was that the function be equal to the polynomial at 0. Second information was the first derivatives be equal. And the third information is that, uh, okay, first derivative is equal. Now we're going to set the second derivative is equal, right, at 0. Okay, who can tell me, first of all, what is the second derivative of this polynomial, p double prime of x? So take it from p prime, right? 2a sub 2 plus 
And instead of writing six, you see, I'm going to write it like this, three times two, because I want to keep the pattern. This is going to help me when I um, generalize it, three times two, which is, of course, six, a sub three times x. What will the next one be? Four times three, a sub four, x squared. What happens if you plug in a zero for x? All the x terms disappear. We have 2a sub 2. What should I set that equal to in terms of the function? Up there with the black check mark, right? p double prime at 0 should be equal to what? f double prime of 0, based on this. So set this equal to f double prime of 0. From here, what can you tell me about a sub 2? f double prime of 0 divided by that is the uh, a sub two, another coefficient solved in terms of the function f. Okay, if we can just just to a sub three maybe, and then from there let's uh, let's jump to a sub n because once we have a sub n, we're going to be able to write the general formula for this infinite polynomial that approximates the function. Okay, so let's do one more step. The next condition that needs to be satisfied is the third derivative at zero for the function and the polynomial must be equal. First of all, what is the third derivative of x for the polynomial? Take it from the second derivative line. Take it from this line. Excuse me, I'm going to bring that back. Okay, so what is the third derivative of this polynomial taken from this line? Right, six. In other words, three times, two times, a sub three. Um, the x disappears when you take the derivative, right? The next one will be 4 times 3 times 2 a sub 4 times what? x plus the remaining terms. And what do you get when you plug in 0 here for x? All the x terms are going to disappear once again, and we will have 6. In other words, um, 3 times 2 times 1, that's how I'm going to write that, a sub 3. I could also write it like this, couldn't I? 3 factorial, because 3 times 2 times 1 is 3 factorial, right? And notice the next one, what is, what is the next one going to have? If you dif differentiate it one more time, 4 times, 3 times, 2 times 1, that will be 4 factorial. You see, that's why I was trying to keep the pattern there, so you could see that emerging, the factorial. So, if this is equal to 3 factorial, and remember from the top that the third derivative at 0 must equal to the function's third derivative at 0. Oh, let me not forget my a sub 3. So now, can you tell me what a sub 3 is? From this equation, right? What do we get? Exactly. Okay, from here, I think it's going to be easier to go to a general rule. Let's first write a sub 4 without even going through the details. Any guesses as to a sub 4 is going to be? Right, the fourth derivative. Uh, if we put it in parentheses, the power that's understood to be the derivative, not the, not the exponent. So if I put like 4 in parentheses, and sometimes we use the Roman numeral for differentiation of higher powers, higher derivatives. So the fourth derivative at 0 divided by what? 4 factorial. So in general, how could we write the nth derivative, the a sub n? We might guess that a sub n is going to be the nth derivative at 0 divided by what? Divided by n factorial. Yes, that's the fourth, uh, fourth derivative. You didn't have to use that. You could just use uh, the regular four. As long as you put it in parentheses, it's understood to be the derivative. So now we have the general formula. Remember, we're trying to find a polynomial. Finding the polynomial boils down to finding the coefficients. Now we have a general rule for the coefficients. Let's put it all together now, rem uh, remembering what the polynomial was like. Go to the top of the page. The polynomial was like this. Now we know what a sub 0 is. 
We know what a sub 1 is, etc. So let's put it all together. I'm going to copy that polynomial to the bottom of the page so we can put the pieces together. And in your handout, it should be on the second page. Okay. So instead of a sub 0, what should I be writing? Look back to your notes. What was a sub 0? Look, look, just look up in this page. What was a sub 0? Up there. f of 0, right? So we're going to put f of 0 there for a sub 0. Just put f of 0. Okay. What was a sub 1? I'm going to leave some blanks because a sub 1 is the coefficient of x, then we want the coefficient of x squared, then we want the coefficient of x cubed, and in general the coefficient of the nth term, x to the n. Okay. So what was the coefficient of x? In other words, what was a sub 1 based on what we just found? What was a sub 1? f prime of 0. Okay, I'm not going to be scrolling back and forth, so I expect you to tell me these values. Please. So a sub 1 is f prime of 0. Okay, what is a sub 2? f double prime at 0 divided by 2, which I could really write as 2 factorial. It's the same thing, right? I'm just trying to get the same pattern going there. Okay, for x cubed, triple prime at 0 divided by 3 factorial for x sub n, the nth derivative at 0 divided by n factorial, right? So what we have here is this is our polynomial p of x. And if you look at that uh, boxed in expression in your handout, that's exactly what they have there for the polynomial that approximates f of x. I'll actually turn the page so you can see it here as well. Uh, it's going to be on my next page. Let's see. Here it goes. So the function that approx um, rather the polynomial that approximates the function is given by this gigantic looking polynomial. But look at the very end of it there. It simplifies. Everything simplifies. If you write in compact summation notation, in summation notation, this is what the polynomial is. Okay. Your a sub n is the n derivative at 0 divided by n factorial. Um, then you have x to the n because as n goes from 0 to infinity, you'll have the different powers of x. That's your polynomial, basically. And, and that long expression written as a summation on the right-hand side uh, gives you the short compact notation. By the way, what would this summation give you if n was 0? Because look at the bottom of the part series starts at n equals 0. If n is 0, what is 0 factorial? Have we mentioned that in this class? It's 1. What is the 0 derivative? That would be the function itself, f. So the, basically, the first uh, coefficient here would be f of 0, and x to the 0 is 1. So all you would get is the first term here, which is f of 0. What if you plug in a 1 in there? What would you get? If you plug in n equals 1, you get the first derivative at 0 divided by 1 factorial times x to the first power. That is your second term over here, right? So as you increment n, uh, starting with 0, you will get this one. When n is 1, you'll get this one, etc. You'll get each term of this infinite series. By the way, what we just did is called a power series expansion for f of x centered at the point 0, because we always plugged in 0 in our derivatives. But what if you were using not 0, but any arbitrary point c? Then your equation actually would become this one. The only difference between that one and this one is instead of x, you have x minus c. Instead of f of 0 or f prime of 0, you have f prime of c. So 0 has been replaced by c, basically. The second one has a special name. This one is, even though it's a power series, it's called uh, specifically a Taylor series centered at c. The first one has a special name. It's called the Maclaurin series. By the way, Maclaurin series automatically assumes it's centered at 0. You don't have to say the word 0. Maclaurin uh, is associated with the word 0, basically. And Taylor series, that they have to tell you what the uh, center is. In this case, in general, it's going to be the point C. OK, 
Okay, so now that we have the general formula, we're ready to attack any function, any of these black box, fun black, uh, black box function that, uh, that I was talking about earlier in the semester, or earlier in this chapter. Let's start with the easy one once again. Uh, we did see last class the first three terms of e to the x. Could somebody remind me, what was those three terms? We did a second degree polynomial for e to the x. Right now, we're going to do the general polynomial, or what is called the Maclaurin series for e to the x. But when we did just the first uh, few terms, the second degree, what did we get? Was it something like this, x squared over 2? Exactly, Maclaurin automatically assumes centered at 0. So last time I believe we had gotten this one for e to the x. That's just the first three terms. Today we're going to get the infinite series expansion for e to the x. And not just for e to the x, but any given function f of x. Correct. Last time we assumed uh, center was 0, so today we would call that Maclaurin series. Except Maclaurin series is usually not just the first three terms, but the infinite expansion. And that's what we're about to do. OK, so we're going to do answer the following questions for e to the x. First, we're going to come up with the Maclaurin series expansion, not just the first three terms like we did last time, but the, the general polynomial, the general infinite power series for it. Anytime you write an infinite sum, there is the possibility it may not converge. So in part b, we'll determine the interval of convergence. From there, we're going to do some estimations, such as e to the 0.5. And finally, in part E, we're going to talk about the derivative of E to the x. You know, in Calc 1, we gave you a rule. Um, perhaps you show a proof for it. Uh, you saw a proof for it. Perhaps you didn't. But you will see how easy things are the moment you can convert them to infinite series expansions. You're going to be able to see that um, the derivative of E to the x is itself. There's going to be a very simple proof for it. Let's begin with part A to derive a Maclaurin series for f of x equals e to the x. OK, I'm going to copy that general formula from the last page. OK, so this is the general formula that we'll be using anytime we uh, we're trying to get it um, Maclaurin series, right? So the given function is f of x. I always start with that because it makes an easy example. All the derivatives are the same, right? So let's begin. Um, to be able to find the expansion, we need to know the first derivative, the second derivative, all successive derivatives. So let's begin with those. Since f of x equals e to the x, OK, what is f prime of x, e to the x, evaluated at 0? e to the 0 is 1, right? By the way, what is f of 0? That is also 1. And as we know, all the successive derivatives are going to be e to the x. And they will all evaluated at 0 will give us the value of 1. So this is going to be a relatively easy one to evaluate. But we'll get to other ones soon. So now that we know this pattern, let's write down the p of x function. So the, e to the x can be approximated by this polynomial. What should I be putting for f of 0? What do we determine for f of 0? That's f of x evaluated at 0. That is 1, right? So instead of f of 0, I can write 1 plus. OK, what can I write for f prime of 0? It's also 1, right? 1 over 1 factorial times x, that's just 1 times x here. Basically, all the successive derivatives are going to be equal to 1 as well. So what will the next term look like? x squared over 2 factorial. 
of course, two factorial is just two. And if you look at just the first three terms here, we have what we got last time, right? One plus x plus uh, x squared over two, except that we put the x squared over two first, and then the x, and then the one, right? So we already have those three terms. But the beauty of this method is you can use it with any function. It doesn't have to be e to the x. You have the general formula up there for any function f of x. OK, what will the next term be? Again, the triple derivative of 0 is still 1, right? So the next term will be 1 times correct, x cubed over 3 factorial. So what will the general term be then? Over n factorial. So could we then write this as a summation, as a compact summation notation? The, the above infinite power series as a summation can be written as if n goes from 0 to infinity of what? If you have the general uh, generic term here, then basically you're, you're, you can just use that again, x to the n over n factorial. And sometimes, uh, I, I always suggest, once you write something like that, check the first few terms, making sure you are really getting what you are trying to get. Like if n is 0, you will have what? x to the 0 over 0 factorial. Is that 1? If you plug in n equals 0 in here, what do you get? which is the first term above, right? What if you plug in the next one? n equals 1, you'll get x to the 1 over 1 factorial, you'll get the second term, etc. cetera. Um, so already we have um, quite an accomplishment here, because think about it, you know, the number e, if you're trying to get a good approximation for it, all you would have to do is on the top series, what would you need to plug in for x if you're trying to determine what, uh, what e is? We all know E is like 2.718, et cetera, but say you want to get a lot of decimals for it. You want to get a good approximation for it. So in the above series, plug in x equals 2. If I'm trying to approximate the value of E, e is, that's E to the 1, right? So x is equal to 1. So what, what will that give you for E? So plug in x equals 1, basically. 1 plus 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 6, right? Uh, so it's already like 2 and a half plus uh, 0.167, et cetera. So it, the more terms you add, the better the approximation for E is going to get. But at the moment, uh, we haven't yet shown that this power series is defined for any x. So let's do that next. That was part B of the question was saying, now that you have a power series for E to the x, can you determine what is the interval of convergence? Because just because we wrote the sum, it doesn't mean it's actually going to converge. So let's do that checking in part B. Part B was asking, if you look at the wording of the problem, it said, determine the interval of convergence for the power series. OK, that's a direct application of what we learned last class. Uh, for interval of convergence, we always use the ratio test, right? So for interval of convergence, use ratio test. Yes, sure. So part B says, determine the interval of convergence. And that's what we're about to do next. OK, so how are we going to use ratio test with the sum? What should I be doing? Right, take the limit of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. And we want that to be less than 1 for convergence, right? So let's do that. Applying ratio test means to do the following. Take the limit of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n as n goes to infinity. So for this, for this series up here, it's going to become limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. As a matter of fact, I think this was, this might have been the first example that we did under power series. We did x to the n over n factorial. But let's just do it again as a refresher. Uh, divided by a sub n. So that's times 1 over a sub n. If we simplify this, what would we get? If 
exactly. We get x over m plus 1 because this can be written as m plus 1 times n factorial. Right. Now, what is the limit of this as n goes to infinity? Just assume x is fixed. It's any real number. Think of it as 5, 10, 25, even a million. Whatever it is, it's a fixed number. But the bottom keeps getting larger and larger and larger. So where does the ratio go? Zero. Normally, we would set this less than 1, right? And we would say, OK, solve for x. But there is no, no x here. That means this converges for every x. So this series converges for every x. What that means is the interval of convergence is all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. So that means when a moment ago, when I was doing e to the first power, so I was not out of line in doing that. In other words, you can't plug in any x value. Even though the series was expanded around the point x equals 0, you can use any x value. But the catch is, the further away you go from 0, the more terms you're going to need to add to get a good approximation. And I would like to show you a picture of that to see what, what we mean by that. Uh, let's see. I, earlier, I did a test with a scientific notebook. Let's see if I can find my file. Uh, scientific notebook. Okay. okay, graph of sine and power series right there. Okay, I graphed a few. A few um, polynomials, like look, look on the bottom of the page here. OK. If you just add the first two terms of e to the x, look at the top of the page right now. f sub 1 is basically, I added uh, a polynomial of degree 1 there. Um, what was e to the x? Look back to your notes. e to the x was 1 plus x plus x squared over 2, etc. right? If you just add the first two terms, you have a linear function, right? If you add the first three terms, you have a quadratic function. Then I jumped ahead a little bit. I added um, the first five terms, it seems, all the way to x to the 4. So I, basically, I'm adding more and more terms for each of these functions. And look at what they look like. Look at what the graphs look like. Oops, that's not the one, the one further up. OK. First of all, the one that you see here in black, that is your e to the x. That's the actual function e to the x that's given in black curve here. OK. Now, which one do you think is the second one, the 1 plus x? 1 plus x? That's a straight line, right? That's the red one. Now, look how much the, this red line approximates the black line. Um, see, this one was the actual e to the x. This one was the actual e to the x. It goes like this. We know the graph of e to the x, right? Now, look at the graph of this one. This is, so you see, um, it's approximating roughly from here to here. It's approximating, it's, it's ar around e to the x really close. But as you go away from 0, it's not going to approximate it very well. You see, it's getting away from e to the x over here, right? OK, if you add one more term, let's see, what was the next one I had? Uh, we had 1 plus x plus x squared over 2. Any guesses which one that might be? The light green or the dark green? They could, uh, basically, that sh um, the next one should be the dark green, because the dark green, look, it wraps around the e to the x a little bit longer, but not that long, right? But the light green one, look at the light green one. It wraps around e to the x much longer, like all the way from negative 2 to roughly to positive 2, right? So that's going to approximate e to the x even better. So the more terms you add, the better the approximation actually turns out to be. If you like, let's do our own right now. Let's add one more term there ourselves. Uh, the last one I did was the first six terms. OK, let, let's say that I add two more terms there. Um, so what would be the next one? Tell me the next term uh, for the e to the x. 
x to the 7 divided by what? 7 factorial. And what would the next term be? x to the 8 divided by That's the easy six. Divide by eight factorial, right? Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna copy that function. Edit copy and go to my graph. If you click on the graph, near the bottom there's usually a box. If you click on the box, it lets you edit the graph. I'm gonna go to items plot it. Click on here. This is the first item, second item. Looks like I have defined them earlier. Okay, I want to add an item. And I'm just going to paste it, see if it accepts it. Okay, good. And what color do you want this new one to be graphed? How about the purple or something different? Okay, do you want purple or yellow? Okay, let's go with purple. I'll just say okay. Okay, you see that one wraps around e to the x so well. You hardly see a difference. Only look near the very, very end here. Just look near the very end. Uh, let me use a different color. Like right here, they're separating. You see, they're starting to separate there. But up to that point, you cannot even see the black term anymore because it completely overwrites it. So when you add so many terms, now you're, you're approximating e to the x in a much wider range. On the right-hand side, you don't even see a difference because up to 3, it seems like a perfect replica of the function, as you can see. Okay, let's go back and finish the other parts of our question. Part C was asking us, estimate e to the point 5 using the first four terms. Estimate e to the point 5 using the first four terms. So we want e to the point 5 using the first four terms. Okay, we already know what the series is, so this should be a very simple step, right? Because we know that e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, etc. Now let's plug in 0.5 everywhere we see an x. So e to the 0.5 is not going to be exactly that, so I'm going to put an approximation here. Because the more terms you add, the better the approximation. Ultimately, infinitely many terms will give you the exact answer. But this is a pretty fast converging series, and you're going to see that the answer will be very close to the actual result, especially since we chose a value very close to zero. Because remember, the further away you go from zero, the more and more terms you need to add to get a good approximation. So let's add these numbers. And remember, you know, this is just a polynomial, which is four operations. We could do this even without a calculator. Um, you know, we know how to do our arithmetic, right? And then we're going to check this against the actual answer of e to the 0.5 in the calculator. So let's see what we get, first of all, if you add these four terms. Okay, let me know what you're getting, please. That sounds right. 1.6458, roughly. So, 6458. Okay. And what is the calculator answer? Which, again, we recognize it's like a black box. We have no idea what's happening when we plug that in. Uh, but at least now we have one way to see the answer with four operations. But the calculator answer is e to the 0.5. One point uh, one point six four nine, let's say, right? One point six four eight seven, something like that. So if you think about it, to the nearest hundreds, we have the same answer. To the nearest hundreds, one was one point sixty five. Uh, well, I guess yeah, it would be one point sixty five. The other is one point one point sixty five. So already by just adding the first four terms, we have a pretty good idea about what the answer is. And again, calculators, computers, they're designed to do things fast. You give it some, uh, you know, some rules like 
addition, subtraction, multiplication. So to evaluate e to the 0.5, you know, you tell them add up the first 50 terms. They, they can quickly tell, do that and give you the answer that you see on the screen, of course. Part D of the question said, I think we already did part D, didn't we? Part D says check it against the calculated value, which we already did. So let's move on and take a look at part E. Prove using the series derived that the derivative of e to the x is itself. Now we all know by now that, that the derivative of e to the x is itself, but in a sense, the more higher levels of math you go into, the more you get a better understanding of the basics, things that were given to you as rules. Now you can go down and understand it. Like think about the the volume of a sphere. You know, we maybe in, in uh, high school you memorized that formula. Now you can use calculus to derive that formula. So one formula we gave you in Calc one was we said the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, right? And the, the proof was a little bit complicated it, it, uh, because how would you prove something like that in Calculus 1? The only way to prove that in Calc 1 is you would have to use the limit definition of a derivative, something like this. f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, right? And f of x plus h would be this, minus f of x would be that all over h. And it's, it's still complicated because um, it relies on another limit, etc. Let's see how simple it is now. We're trying to show the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, okay? It'll be really simple. So what we're trying to show is that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Okay. Let's start with what we know about e to the x. Its clone function is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, etc. Okay. To find the derivative of e to the x, we're going to differentiate the right-hand side. And any time you deal with infinite quantities, you know, there's usually a lot of theorems, even uh, to do what we're about to do. There is a theorem that says, yes, you can differentiate term by term. Okay, for when you have a power series that converges for all x. So you can differentiate term by term. So th take the derivative of the first term above, and what do you get? What is the derivative of 1? It's 0, right? It's just a constant. Its derivative is 0. Okay. What is the derivative of x? It's 1. What is the derivative of x squared over 2 factorial? That's 2 times x over 2 factorial, which is 2, right? Some of you already said x. You are correct. What would be the next derivative? The derivative of x cubed over 3 factorial. That would be... 3 times x squared divided by 3 factorial, which is really 3 times 2, okay. plus, etc. Let's simplify what we just got. Okay, What we just got is 1 plus, the 2's cancel here, right? 1 plus x plus x squared over 2. We could do a few more terms. But do you see what's happening here? We took the derivative of e to the x, and we came up with an infinite series. Do you recognize this infinite series as, as a, a special series? It's the same thing that we started with, right? It, it, because 2 can be written as 2 factorial, right? And you could do a few more terms to see this better. But we came up with the same thing back. So it's a very simple proof that indeed the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And there is another way to do this proof, and that relies on the summation. Because we know that e to the x is summation of x to the n over n factorial, as n goes from 0 to infinity. So then the derivative of e to the x would be Okay, differentiate each term, okay? When you differentiate x to the n over n factorial, you are differentiating with respect to x. So n factorial is just a constant. What is the derivative of x to the n? Good, Gracie, n times x to the n minus 1, right? So I can write it like this. This is the same as n times x to the n minus 1 
divided by um, n factorial. Now here is the catch. When you differentiate an infinite series, you bump up the lower index. Okay, so if the lower index started at 0, now you're going to start at 1. The reason for that is because you are losing the first term because the first term was just a constant. Now the constant disappears, so you don't have to, have to factor in for that. You have to decide, start with the next term. That's why you're bumping up the, the bottom index by 1. This applies anytime you're differentiating a power series. Uh, simplify. What is n over n factorial? Because n factorial on the bottom is uh, n, n times n minus 1, etc. So that becomes n minus 1 factorial on the bottom. And technically, this is the same as e to the x because um, if you replace n minus 1 with like t or k um, or n even, you can rewrite this as it's possible to re rewrite this like this, x to the n over n factorial, except start with, at what value? Start at 0 because you see... If you plug in 1 into the previous one, you would have x to the 0 over 0 factorial, right? But now that I kind of shifted everything a little bit, plug in 0 as your first index, x to the 0 over 0 factorial. You get the first term uh, as you got up, up there. If you plug in x equal, n equals 1, you get x over 1 factorial. You'll get all the other terms, and this is the same as e to the x. Um, you know, clearly this one, previous approach was easier because you didn't have to deal with any of that. But I wanted you to show you this approach also because when you take differential equations, sometimes it's important to differentiate a summation in the summation format, in the compact notation. It's really it's not that difficult. You just have to deal with your indices a little bit and treat n as a constant, just differentiate the x to the n portion. Okay, now I'm going to give you a brand new one. As you can see, these questions are taking a long time. I'll give you a little bit of time to work on it, and then we'll discuss the answer. And our function this time is sine x. So we're going to do pretty much the same analysis, but this time for the function sine x. Okay, I'm going to pause the recording here. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to work on this. Then we'll come back and, and go over your answers.